auction keeps prices down far more effectively. As long as suffering of sentient beings remain, I will remain in order to serve. I imagined God um, like my grandfather. In conversations tonight, my guest is a man who has been described as a crusader who's dared to take on the establishment and vested interests. To others, perhaps he's a man obsessed with himself. But few can question the profound impact he's had on the conduct of elections in India. I'm delighted to welcome the Chief Election Commissioner, Mr. T.N. Session. Mr. Session, I just noticed when you came in, uh, despite the flurry of the countdown to the elections and, and, and obviously the amount of travel you're doing and the number of decisions you're involved with, uh, you managed to look incredibly relaxed, calm and composed. What is the secret of this? Well, it's, I'm not merely looking incredibly calm and relaxed. I am incredibly calm and relaxed. It's partly because one knows that the arrangements are absolutely, absolutely, totally well in hand. The other thing, of course, is that uh, I have a probably God-given gift that the substance of the current doesn't flow into the entire body. It passes through the skin. There is an effect in physics called the skin effect. I do that. Could you explain this skin effect? What happens? When a high voltage alternating current passes through a metal conductor, contrary to what people normally believe, as if the entire current passes through the entire wire, it doesn't. It passes only on the skin of the wire. Similarly, the higher the voltage of uh, surrounding events and uh, incidents and happenings, the more on the surface it is. It doesn't enter the body of my existence. Uh, to that extent, therefore, the core is relaxed. The core is not, uh, uh, shall we say, unsettled. What satisfactions do you derive uh as, as in, in the preparations for the con conduct of the elections, that you know you, there's, there's been a long period of working and setting uh, things in motion. How successful do you think it has been, this, this process? Of well, of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating when it comes to the polling on the 27th, the 2nd, and the 7th. The job is, if I may say so, with humility, job of unbelievable dimensions. 590 million voters, 820,000 polling booths, 5 million civilian employees, almost 2 million policemen outside, 20,000 tons of paper, places which can't quite be reached on anything but camel back or elephant back or by foot. Uh, Murphy's Law, anything can go wrong. But um, touch wood, in the last five years I have sat in this chair. In the 91 general election, in the large number of state elections we had in 93, 94, 95, We've never had to say, sorry, please wait, we are not ready. We've been ready on the dot at 7 a.m. on the appointed day. Are there worries? Yes, there are worries. There are substantive worries about the defects in the Indian election system. There are uh, transitory worries of what will happen on the day of the poll. Somebody or the other will lose his cool. Somebody will try to use a little strong arm tactics, a little violence here, an intimidation there. So there are these two kinds of worries. One is, of course, the substantive worry. Uh, Indian elections are damaged by a number of unfortunate uh, things, some of it curable, but not being cured. Some of it is incurable. What are some of these things that, that it's damaged? By? Well, I call them in Indian Sanskrit, I call them the Dasha Mahapatakas of the Indian election, the 10 great problems of Indian election. Uh, the voters' roles are not as good as they should be. Recently, when we gave identity cards throughout the country, we established that the roles were about 96% correct, 4% was wrong. It was not 96% correct which bothered or which made you happy or unhappy. The 4% was not. There were people who were dead whose names were still on. Uh, people who had moved on to some other part of the country or even the world or part of the city whose names were still in the wrong address. 
then there is a problem that uh, you take a city like Delhi, something like 55 percent of the population is in slums. Bombay, a little more than that is in slums. And it is difficult to give these people an address. There is no street, there is no door number. And there are people whose address is literally footpath in front of door number 40, so and so street. So the voters' lists are not as correct as they should be. Then there is a question of the location of the polling booth. In the past, unfortunately, not enough care was given to this with the result that the polling booths very often got located at places where the weak and the oppressed could not quite reach. And in many cases, half the population was weak and oppressed because all the women were weak and oppressed. Then there were the economically and socially backward classes who could not get access to the caste Hindu locations of the village. So the second one was polling booths. Sometimes people had to walk long distances. The book said two kilometers in the plains and four kilometers in the hills. Very often it was not true. Very often the building chosen was a rotten building. Or sometimes you did it on the veranda of a building so that there was all, it was absolute mayhem, confusion. The third thing is the intimidation. Open, closed, surface, under surface, based on religion, on caste, on economic status. Uh, from simple social intimidation to open violence, right down to making country bombs and country weapons and uh, using of those for intimidating the voters. So that entire batch which is intimidation where you try to get the man's vote not by virtue of argument and conviction but by fear and uh, or fear of violence. Are you still sort of uh, despairing? There have been so many positive elements to uh, the conduct of these elections. No, 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 no. I, there is no despair at all because by the time I'm finished, I'm going to be telling you that every Indian has the right to hold his head absolutely high. That if you take all the countries which have had their flags raised in the UN compound after 1945, India is the only country where democracy has survived. Yeah, there are defects, there are deficiencies. Not to be aware of them is being foolish. But in 50 years, of 1952 was the first election, 1996, 44 years, we have changed the government by peaceful means at least three, four times in 77, again in 80, again in 89, again in 91. The army, the defense forces haven't come miles near interfering with this. Uh, when we got independence in 1947 or declared the republic in the first elections, our literacy rate was hovering around 20 percent. Today it's something like 45 percent. But the Indian voter is a villager. He may not have had formal schooling, but he is not unwise. So he knows what he is doing most of the time. So to go back to the defects which I was mentioning, then there are uh, questions of actual physical violence on the day of the poll rigging and booth capturing uh, when you don't drive out the fellow sitting there but only take the ballot papers and mark them that's called rigging you drive them out and do it in their absence it's booth capturing then there are mistakes committed at the counting table then there is the absence of impartiality among the civil servants throughout the administration but i deliberately reserve the two and the most serious uh, defects for the last one is the use of religion, caste, language, and all kinds of petty matters relating to the heterogeneity of India's population for appeal to votes. This is something which is tremendously unfortunate. And the more important thing is the amount of money power which has come to play in elections. The limit of expenses set is pathetically low. It's one of the biggest jokes until I got it increased to four and a half lakhs for a parliament seat with a million voters the other day. It was one and a half lakhs and that was good enough even to send a postcard. Not good enough even to send a postcard. Now it is four and a half lakhs. Even now it's pitifully inadequate. But in 1977, after all that uh, turmoil which happened in 75 and 76, parliament went and passed a law which said that Expenses incurred by friends and expenses incurred by party need not be included in the total of the expenditure. Now, this is like completely 
opening the back side of the wall while trying to say the front door is under guard. Efforts to get this altered by myself, my predecessors for the last 20 years from 77 till today have not succeeded. And I know one MP who came and sat in my house and said that against the limit of one and a half lakhs, which was the then limit, he spent only 85 million rupees for his election. So then I keep telling my audiences for echo that below the three lines we have from the Veda written Satya Meva Jayate. I keep telling them that we should write Asatya Meva Jayate because every single member of the parliament who walks in, puts his best foot forward, utters a lie and comes in. And the party accounts are not transparent. India has a lot of corruption. Most of India's corruption is attributable to election corruption. So, with the result that over the years Indian elections have come to, we describe three C's as I call them, cash, criminality and corruption. Or with three M's, money power, muscle power, minister power. Sir, you just mentioned uh, and you've emphasized this aspect of the ceiling on election expenditure. Mm -hmm. Uh, how are you going to go about enforcing that after the election? That is the law, and, and yet we all recognize that that sum of money is going to be exceeded. No. What we have done is that whereas the efforts at getting parliament to amend the law or to take away this exclusion which was made in 1977 is wiped out so that all expenses will be attributed. Two, to get parties to write their accounts and make their own receipts and expenditure transparent. These two are taking time. But what we have done is, uh, uh, we have now tried to clamp at the expenditure end of it. Uh, so we have some quaint old laws, there is a section in the Indian Penal Code enacted in 1919, by which if I spend money for your election without your approval, I can be punished. We are using that now. The result is obvious on the roads. We have put uh, videography throughout the country to watch opulent expenditure. We have appointed income tax commissioners as expenditure observers who go around. We could lay down uh, that each candidate must keep his accounts as elaborately. We have prescribed a register with 37 headings under which every day the candidate has to keep his expenses. The result has been electrifyingly good. while. There certainly is no measurement of the actual expenses before and after. In the 1995 assembly elections, my private feeling, and please don't ask me for proof because I have none, is that we have brought down expenditure by a factor of 10. Where somebody was spending, shall we say, 20 lakhs before, he now spends only 2 lakhs. Or somebody was spending 50 lakhs, he spends only 5 lakhs now. It's not satisfactory, but that's the best we have. I hope that someday Parliament will amend the legislation. But given the fact that uh, it's widely expected that even this limited sum uh, that has been defined and, and, and your suggestion that uh, election expenditure has been uh, reduced drastically, which obviously most people would, would applaud, uh, but I still, I, I think that most people still expect that that figure will be exceeded. So how rigorously will you be enforcing the figure, the, the ceiling? Of See, it's like asking how rigorously will you enforce the nutrition of a baby with diarrhea. This baby has diarrhea. The rear end is in great uh, uh, difficulty. How much can you plug? He said the law is very weak. If party expenses need not be included. If I can have a hundred cars running in my constituency as a candidate, and somebody comes and says, these cars don't love on, run on love. How do they run? But my friends are running it for me. So the answer is, how much can you enforce? It's, it's, it's a tough, it's uphill. It's difficult, but uh, the response to what we've been doing in the last two, three years has been enormously good. If only we could get legal backing. And I, we, we've written from the commission to the government as recently as in February and said, plug the loophole at the back and raise this four and a half limit, lakh limit to 15 lakhs. What advice does uh, the T in election, the voter, uh, give to the voter? The election commission, at yes. least speaking for myself, uh, Please check whether your name is in the voters list at least a couple of days before. It's easy to check it up. Don't consider it a chore which is avoidable. It's a responsibility as a citizen. Two, on the day of the election, on the day of the voting, please vote early. 
if you wait till the late afternoon, many people think here is a free holiday for nothing. There is not even a religious observance to be done. So, as I am fond of saying, order the wife to get the servant to prepare masal dosa and say, we'll go to the booth in the afternoon. By then they know that you are a little slow in coming and somebody will impersonate you and put your vote in. So, what? what early? What freely? Discuss as much as you like. Analyze as much as you like. Never share your decision making with anybody, not even with husband or wife or father or son. Vote fearlessly because your vote is never known to anybody else. Uh, today we have even mixed up ballot papers from several polling booths so that they won't even know which part a mohalla or a street voted for. Nobody can any longer find out. And uh, if I may say so, without appearing facetious, if you don't know how else to select your candidate, select him on the same basis on which you would select a son-in-law to marry your daughter or your sister. Make sure that the khandan is good, the family is good. Make sure that the individual is good. All right, if the guy has some minor defects, maybe you will overlook them. But if he has a major defect or flaw of character, you will not marry off your sister or your daughter to anybody who comes along merely because your sister's age is going up. So then finally people ask me this question, supposing all the names look unsatisfactory, what do I do? Well, all that I can say is if you know early enough, please stand for election yourself. Do I sense uh, a sense of sort of disappointment and, and despair perhaps in, in the manner in which... Uh, no, very contrary, on the very contrary. There is reason, as I said earlier, for every reason Indian to hold his head absolutely high. How far and, and what do you think uh, have been the achievements of the Election Commission uh, during your tenure? In it's very embarrassing to give that uh, fair answer because either I am likely to suffer from modesty, which I don't, or I am likely to suffer from immodesty, which again I am not sure whether I will. We have had a fair degree of success in terms of keeping things quiet, in terms of, for example, the implementation of the Model Code of Conduct is at least two orders of magnitude better today. If you could do another couple of elections with the present degree of tightness, plus if Parliament could kindly amend the laws to make sure that the intent of the people is carried out in terms of the law, which would then make it easier for the Commission to implement them. I think we would then be able to say that well and truly there is nowhere in the world where there is a democratic procedure of comparable magnitude. If you don't do that, see what's happening in some of our neighboring countries where the elections carry no credibility. Today in India, one can say that the elections carry a large degree of credibility. I'm not saying they're fully credible, but surely between credibility and lack of credibility, the percentage is clearly in favor of credibility. That's a great achievement. In a recent interview, you've, you've, you've said uh, that you know, modesty is a prerogative of fools. What, what, what did you mean by that? You see, as I told you, that um, if an Indian holds his head high and says, where else in the world is democracy practiced like this, despite all the appalling difficulties we have in sheer sizes and numbers, in literacy, in the number of people in slums, in the number of um, illiterate people. And yet still, time after time after time, we have changed governments without violence. So, why should India be modest about it? I'm, many people must have mistaken it as a statement that I was talking of myself, that modesty is a virtue of fools. India has no reason to be unnecessarily modest about its election. India has reason to hold its head high. And if some of us have contributed to it, I hope a certain degree of pride is testified. Would you say that that uh, uh, some of your um, some of some of the techniques you have used, or, or shall I use the word, uh, some of the posturing uh, that that people have commented upon, uh, has has been just that posturing, sort of a strategy or device that you used uh, to to achieve results? Oh yes, I remember once upon a time reading about a padri who had written a sermon and who had written on the margin, argument weak, speak loudly here. Sometimes we speak loudly when the argument is weak, or the ability to implement is a little less than what one desperately wishes one had. So, I don't quite call it posturing. For example, people ask me, uh, we videograph the entire election proceedings now. 
do you read all the do you watch all the tapes surely from 500 constituencies there must be 2000 3000 tapes of 3 hours worth of watching each do you do watching for 6000 hours no the fact that we are watching is good enough everybody ad used to address me as chief election commissioner government of india do, do, does it make a lot of difference that i am not the chief election commissioner of the government of india but I am the Chief Election Commissioner of India. It's a very minor change in emphasis, but it's a major difference that I am not part of the government. Who are you answerable to? Certainly I am answerable to the President. Certainly I am answerable to the people. Certainly I am answerable to Parliament in the largest sense. I am answerable to the courts for any wrong which I may do. All this is true. So. Posturing has been an essential element of this. Mr. Session, is, is there a, a, a personal, a private uh, session and is there a, a public session that uses a public persona for effect and, and to achieve results? Mm. Probably there is. Not much of a difference, but um, there are cases in which you can achieve a great deal by posturing, which cannot necessarily be achieved without that kind of posturing. For example, I have a almost passionate necessity to uh, obtain efficiency in work, which was written down as one of my adverse characteristics uh, 40 years ago when I first had independent charge when somebody wrote on me and said he sets impossibly high standards for himself and is apt to be utterly impatient with those who will not measure up to it. That is the private and public standard. You know, I find it difficult to answer your question straight, not because of the question being right or wrong, but because I am not sure what the exact or the fair or truthful answer would be. Some little posturing, yes, not too much. Uh, you know, you, you, you frequently sort of describe yourself as an Alsatian, and, and, and these sort of images uh, and, and descriptions of you in the press as, as someone who's sort of aggressive, who shouts his mouth out. Uh, is, 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 is that the real you? No, no, no. Regrettably, the core is very soft. Uh, I don't know that I should be saying this. It may not be wise, but the core is extraordinarily soft. I've never hurt anybody substantively. And uh, there are no permanent angers. There are only transitory angers for a job done, for a job not done. Job done badly, job done not done in time. I have very often wondered that I might have succeeded much more in life if I could clear myself of the leopard spots, which are flashes of anger. But no leopard can complain that it has spots. I have flashes of anger. What I privately tell myself is that those are only flashes and that when the job is over and the time is done or the time is over and the job is done I carry no uh, reservoir or balance of anger or animus against anybody and in real life um, life has been very rewarding in the sense that even people whom I have spoken to harshly have been extremely good friends is the is the soft uh, session sort of uh, ever hurt by the sort of the public um, assault sometimes so from people or sections of the press? It is, it is but um, I have trained myself um, to be neither excessively elated by positive things. Somebody takes positive notice, somebody writes something very nice. Uh, yeah, there's a possibility that you become elated about it beyond reasonable measure. Similarly, somebody takes adverse notice, some of it based on fact, some of it even based without fact or not based on fact. Uh, the ability not to be excessively exhilarated by positive things or to be excessively depressed by negative things has become a studied characteristic, if I may. It's one of the lessons one has picked up from the Bhagavad Gita, that the characteristic of a person who is well-rounded is that in sadness he is not shattered and in happiness he is not uh, overly attached to the 
happiness i claim that i am bereft of passion fear or uh, anger what then energizes you uh, to to reach out and, and make a difference in the manner that you seek to there is no compromise on that which needs to be done i don't remember even the name of the poet or the author who wrote this one of the earliest things uh, etched in my mind is uh, this sentence which is no uh, commas no punctuation to seek to strive to find and not to yield barring the unpredictable this is perhaps the last uh, election as chief election commissioner that you will have uh, steered uh, what aspirations uh, do you have for yourself after this well, peculiarly i have no aspirations for myself but that doesn't mean i am not ambitious life has been very generous to me uh, i am now 63 i worked for 44 years non stop i graduated at the age of 19 with a masters degree in physics i started working the day after my results came because my principal gave me a lecturer's job and life has been extraordinarily generous to me i have in the normal sense of the word no mountains left to climb and if this is presumptuous so let it be but i am not now looking for other small offices i as i am saying without any disrespect to the portfolio in question i am not itching to become minister for food processing if i have to get into public life in this country if i have to i'll get in only on one condition that i am placed in a position where one can alter things there's so many things which are wrong if you are going to get a position where you will only get the perks of office you will get a nice government house a government car a government telephone people to dance attendance on you i've had enough of it for serving me for a lifetime very often i give the silly answer saying that i am going to dig pits and fill them but i think life has so much more to learn fundamental indian philosophy made you believe that there are two kinds of vidyas to be learned the para vidya and the apara vidya that which is experimental to be lived to be learned physics and chemistry and botany and zoology and life sciences there is another part which cannot be learned by experimentation it can only be learned by experiencing it and on that part of one's existence one has done one hundred of what i would like to do so if i do not get called upon to do public service i would very happily go in trying to learn the experimental side of learning so the answer is uh, when i finish in may june the elections would be over probably my by the time my term is over officially in december the only things which could come up would be a up election which has not been held just now or a kashmir assembly election but i know that i have uh, whatever mark i could or should or was capable of making has been made i don't have much else to prove or to disprove would you go home dissatisfied no would you go home sad partly because i think uh, a country with the background of india deserves much more than what it has today uh, the number of things which are wrong are causes for sadness but i will not for that reason accept a job merely because there is one more job to be done it's perks to be enjoyed if you want me in a job which is other than philosophical it will be only in a job where there is enough power to change things what might that job be as far as i can see if it is not again impertinent there are only two jobs the prime minister's job for obvious reasons and the president's job for hidden reasons to what extent do you think it is possible for individuals to make a difference beyond being uh, president or prime minister of india well i suppose we have outstanding examples in india's own history of people who 
were leaders in their own chosen field of work. There is no need for one's thinking to be restricted to low heights. One can think of the highest heights. One Gandhiji could alter the entire Indian psyche from absolute slavery to absolute uh, confidence. One J.R.D. could uh, alter the entire Indian psyche about uh, uh, how you can be a master of industry but at the same time being conscious of one's responsibility to society. One of the tragic things which I notice today is that such uh, leaders, if you want to call them that, leaders not in the sense of people who wield power, but leaders in the sense of those who make opinions and who modify things. The country is desperately short. So, if I fall between high office and high philosophy, it's possible that I might make an effort at being somebody who influences public thought to some degree. It's a hard path, but it's not an easy path. I suppose um, people who have been leaders have gone through tremendous amounts of uh, internal soul-searching and difficulty and hard work and disappointment. But that's the third alternative which I really have in mind. Uh, because uh, public office of an acceptable level is probably something which I can only aspire in my dreams. To withdraw myself into a shell of philosophy would be probably, if nothing else, a waste of my ardent desire to see things change. I'm hoping that I can get into some one or more fields where one could become a shaper of public opinion by not by virtue of power, uh, but by virtue of philosophy, by virtue of social evolution. You see, the Indian mass of inertia is 930 million people strong. To turn it by one degree needs a prime force of absolutely stupendous magnitude. So one of the ambitions is to turn it by five degrees over the next five years. God only knows whether it will work or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.